Hi, I'm Jeff Sharon from UCF Sports Night. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Brescia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at UCF. Our guest today is Summer Rain Oaks, an environmental activist and one of the hosts of the new Planet Green Eco Network on the Discovery Channel. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, John. Tell us a little bit about Planet Green. I know a lot of people are watching it and I imagine your audience is expanding with each passing week. What, what's it about? What's your role? Well, the CEO from uh, Discovery actually came over from NBC, and he had started or jump started the Sundance Green Channel. And when he came over to Discovery Networks, that's exactly what he wanted to do: was start another green channel. But he wanted to really develop a channel which would be the first 24-hour green network. And so he came up with the idea of Planet Green, and it launched on June 4th in 2008. So it was the first 24-hour 7 network launched uh, to focus on environmental and social issues. And it was pretty exciting. It was pretty exciting to be a part of it. I was one of the, the first talents that they actually came on board with. And it was really nice to see the whole network grow from a seed or an idea to what it is now and to what it's going to be. And Discovery itself has been a network that has taken green pretty seriously and uh, has you know, LEED certified their buildings so and made it green certified and has taken a lot of uh, steps in production and, and, and the education system that they're a part of to just start focusing on sustainability. And to see this foray into television, into media is, has been really great. And something that I feel has been uh, due and is, the time is ripe for it and so it's been, it's been nice to be a part of it. Well, tell us about your journey and getting from where you were before to here. Your interest in environmental matters goes back uh, not just to high school and college, but, but long before that. How did you become interested? What motivated you? Yeah, I, I've always just been a nature kid. I mean, I loved going out in my backyard and exploring what was out there and always fascinated with what, with what I was able to find. I mean, I remember... Uh, one of my first first memories, I feel, was when I was outside in, in the forest and I stuck a stick into some old bricks that were out, outside in, in the woods and I pulled out this uh, saddleback caterpillar and those things are quite frightening because they're, they're very beautiful but I was like, ugh, and I got, I got scared and I threw the stick down and then I was all of a sudden fascinated by it. I was like, wait, wh where did it go? Where did it go? And I think that really uh, is a testament to kind of how I, how I grew, grew up. I just really, you know, you might be frightened by some things that you don't know, but I, then I was always curious. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember my first kinder kindergarten moment for show and tell, we had a really bad year of tent caterpillars and they were just all over the house. I ended up taking an old gallon jug and and literally scraping them off the side of the house and, and putting them in a gallon jug and, and taking them to kindergarten, or kindergarten for show and tell, dumping them out on the table and just seeing the look of horror on my, my teacher's face. And all the kids were like, so cool. And I'm like, yeah, you can pick them up. And so I think like part of what I really loved as a child, I, it, I just had a lot of positive reinforcement. My, my parents were very accepting of it. If I were growing mold in, in, the, uh, in the refrigerator to look at it in a microscope later, my parents were not like, don't grow mold in the, the refrigerator, but they, they were kind of cool with it. So, um, you know, I grew up with that passion. And when I was about seven, eight or nine, I just really became fascinating, uh, fascinated with the American Indian culture and how many individuals within that culture were really connected to the land and that they knew what every single plant could be used for, for what ailment, 
and why and what season. And that was a type of curiosity that I, I then developed and appreciated. And from there, I think the love of all of that grew into a sense of activism, a sense of knowing that this is where I felt comfortable, knowing this is what really interested me, and was able to see the interactions of everything and how it really affected my daily life, affected the people around us, and you know, really grew into the idea that in one sense we're all environmentalists. If we eat, eat the, the food that is grown from the ground, if we breathe the air, if we drink the water, then all in all we're environmentalists because we all want healthy air to breathe and, and, and healthy water to drink uh, for ourselves and our families. And then you went on to actually study this mm -hmm. in college. You were at Cornell University. Yeah, I, um, I uh, matriculated early to Cornell. I had gone to the campus when I was about 13, 14 years old and really fell in love with the school. And there was not many schools that had a an emphasis on environment in a beautiful environment and but also would have other uh, focuses on American Indian cultures. I was interested in Africana studies, just had a little bit more of a liberal arts education. And when I first, it, and also in an area that was close to home, but not like far enough away that I wasn't home. And, uh, and when I went there on campus, it was in the summer, and I just, I fell in love with it. I, I got on campus and I was like, I'm coming here. And so I spun around on my, uh, on my heel and I turned to my mother and I'm like, I'm coming here, this is great. And, uh, and I really fell in love with it, and I fell in love with, uh, with the programs there and uh, started crashing board meetings when I was, I was still a, a junior in high school and walking into waste management meetings and, and knowing full well that this was a place that I wanted to come and to study. And I ended up doing a natural resources major and an entomology major, which is all intensive purposes bugs, which probably goes back to my stories of all those creepy crawlies back when I was a young girl and uh, a concentration in geographic information systems, which is radar and remote sensing. Mm -hmm. And then how did that lead to where you are now? You didn't just go directly into television. Yeah, no, it was, it's, it's been a really fascinating journey from college to now, and I never expected to be who I am or where I am now. And if you ask me that in college, I think up until you know, my junior year, I, I was looking to do work on ecosystem-based management programs, so programs that dealt with a lot of land, with a lot of politics, with a lot of um, maybe cultural influences, thing, things like that. I, I love, I'm comfortable in the complexity of things, right? And when I was, uh, when I was a freshman, when I first matriculated as a student, uh, I, I thought, I'd, you know, I'd just be one of the many fish in the sea and kind of see how it would go, but you know, very quickly I had a lot of advisors and a lot of uh, people around me who were pushing me and, and I think, you know, I, when I came in, I came in with a, a, a pretty decent base of in, an interest in, in ecology and, and really understood a, a, a lot and it g freed up my time to think about other things and when I was, you know, in college with my friends and I started getting, uh, who were not in interested in environmental issues, and um, I, I had gotten published in a, in a few science journals right off the bat uh, from my studies in waste management. And I'm like, what's next? You know? and, and then when I, I started getting a little bit disenchanted, not with school, but the fact that some of my friends who are not in environmental um, studies didn't really quite get what I did. And I think so much of the time we often have that, that way about us where it's like, oh, it's them, it's them. They, don't, they just don't get me. And what I started to realize, it's, it's not as much as it is them, it's me too, it's, it's, it's us, it's all of us. It's that we can't make that connection, even to your best friends or to your parents, uh, to explain how you do what you do or show, more likely show people what you do. And that's when it really started to click with me. I realized that for me, my, my calling would be to go out into audiences that normally wouldn't have these issues on their radar screen and really try to connect with groups that didn't have environment in their life or didn't think that they had environment in their life and, and be able to um, get them there to understand and, and to see how it related and how it could improve their li livelihood. So 
I entered into, my first foray was into the fashion and media space because at, at first I thought, you know, fashion and media has such a grip on um, all of us today. Uh, there's, even if we don't read the TMZs or the Perez Hiltons or whatever it is that we, we read now, um, we're still influenced by it in so many different ways because it's, it's constantly hitting us at all, at all points. And it's such an influential um, audience because you're reaching out to a, a vast majority of people. And um, I originally thought like there, the sustainability and, and fashion and media were on two ends of the spectrum, but now I realize how interrelated it is. And that was my first foray. I just literally packed my, packed my bag, hung up my hiking boots, and, and went to New York and started networking with people within the space and telling them how I wanted to bridge the gap of sustainability in fashion and media. And that really served me well. And, and when you speak passionately, you speak of your vision, and you have a, you have a clear vision, you don't have to have you know exactly what you're going to be doing. But when you have a clear enough vision, I think people are really, really gravitate towards that. And um, my idea was to originally partner with celebrities or personalities within the space. Um, and I never really thought I was going to be a thought leader in my own right moving into the space and developing this expertise, but that's invariably what happened with, with, uh, with my career. And I've always, I've always considered myself first and foremost an activist at heart and have been involved with you know, grassroots movements since I was a very young girl. And that will always be part of who I am because that's what really makes me feel alive. And, uh, and so I've, I've stayed close to that and I've, I've, I've dealt, you know, dealt with groups on the grassroots level, I've dealt with politicians, I've dealt with people within fashion and media, which sometimes couldn't be as different from, you know, night and day. And, uh, and I think as a person involving this space, you have to move fluently between those circles of people because you're going to have to sell environment or social issues differently to different people. And, you know, what I've really learned is there's no, you know, one size fits all solution to environmental issues. And I might be sitting across from uh, a CEO of a company and I might not be able to sell it like we're saving the environment. You might have to sell it like you will have a more energy efficient company and I will save you money. So you just have to, you have to change the language up and, and you have to do it with fashion and media and you just have to make sure that there's a substantive um, uh, feature or argument behind it because you want to use fashion and media as a hook. Um, can't be all the be all end all or it's going to start reading like a trend. You have to use it as a hook and then get people in because the ultimate goal for me is is not to just make people aware but to engage people. Well as an activist what are the issues that compel you and maybe we could start at home in the United States and then take it to the global level. Sure. I mean part of the, part of the uh, the one thing that really drives me is is um, and that I and I've experienced through my life is I I really look highly on on people that have um, helped me. You know, here's here's someone who was growing up who really wanted the best for herself, but also for the rest of society. And and how are you going to do that on like a shoestring budget and shoestring research resources and all and all of that, right? And you know, to to f like for those people who have really empowered me, like that's that's one thing that I see that. I feel close to home on a more personal level is is finding and associating with people and finding the best in everyone and and empowering those people because I feel like in order for us to make behavioral changes and behavioral shifts we need to empower one another and to build the the skills and the tool sets and the, and the confidence and some of those everything else is just an issue I think that is as that's the core focus for me as an activist and then issues such as um, climate change, um, issues like green jobs, like jobs that cannot be outsourced or that are not easily outsourced, but jobs that are like, um, you know, weatherizing your home or put, installing solar panels or creating wind energy or doing, like in my hometown of northeastern Pennsylvania, mine reclamation was a big one that I worked on when I was like 16, 17 years old. And those are issues that I love because, um, one, let's take green jobs, for instance, it's something that is close to home for me, but it also is focused on people who may not spend 20 bucks to save a polar bear, right? Because, you know, some of us have the, the, the privilege of being able to care about the environment, but th there's, others of, there's others that have, may struggle with um, life at home or 
worried about putting food on their plates or getting a paycheck that's you know day by day and uh, putting their kids through school. There's there's a host of challenges that we we as a society as face faces, and so is there a way that you could connect with um, with those of us that are that have those struggles in our daily lives while still getting them connected to the environment, and so. Again, it's, it's looking at those creative ways to connect with people, but also give them the tools, the skills, and like I said, most importantly, the confidence of, of, of doing it themselves. Um, so fashion and media for me was a foray of being able to do that. I'm really you know, uh, a tough advocate on sustainable, better design. Um, energy efficient design, uh, design that's more environmentally and socially responsible, um, particularly within the, the textiles arena, uh, because that was my, my first foray into this, but also, you know, just um, in including different groups of people into the mix, whether that's uh, African Americans or Latinos and Latinas, American Indian, uh, Native American and First Nations cultures. Uh, the LGBT community, like people who, in the and young people, of course, like peop, my peer group, people who are teens, tweens, and twenty-somethings, just entering into the conversation. Just getting those people into the conversation is is a challenge, and I, I see it as um, one of the challenges of our generation is to uh, get those who have previously been voiceless a voice in this in this area. And then as you go from the national level to the international level, because so many of these environmental issues don't respect borders, mm -hmm. uh, they, they are global, what, what are the ones that concern you the most? Well, since I was a young girl, I've always wanted to study in Africa. I mean, uh, I remember creating huge collages on my wall of Africa, and whatever it was, whether it was my mother's National Geographic or I can't, you know, quite pinpoint it, but that was something that really, you know, these these forgotten cultures or these cultures that we may not understand always appealed to me. And um, I had wanted to study abroad and to just get an understanding for what the is issues are internationally um, and sometimes in, in countries that that uh, were less fortunate than, than ours. And, um, you know, for the past five years I had been working on issues in Africa and for the first time I, I went to, to go there and work on some of the projects that I started with uh, or I, I've, I've come, um, come to be with a, a partner of, uh, of mine that, that is South African that lives out in Mozambique working on sustainable forestry initiatives. And issues like that that are happening to like our brothers and sisters halfway across the world is something that really you know really shakes me and um, I, and figuring out how to connect those things with the, the work that I, I do on the ground and the resources that I have on the ground is is a challenge for me every day and you know we're working on 23 different sustainable forestry initiatives and he's training local artisans to create really high-end beautiful uh, sustainably harvested wood products that could be sold on the market but are also teaching them to replant forests and helping them with AIDS education and that in that particular area like some people would say all all is lost because 75 percent of the forest has been destroyed you're working with um, groups of people who are ravaged by the AIDS virus um, and have literally lost so much knowledge about their culture and how their how they grew up and here he's trying to instill it back in them because you know here here you have eight-year-olds like with their with their little siblings that they're raising and they've lost all of that all of that knowledge so you know to be able to connect that whether it's through the product that he sells that story is is important in in my work and and being able to connect projects like that on the ground with the greater picture um, trying to understand how climate change is affecting those who are have the most to lose is is important. Um, you know, just for instance, the soil uh, temperature has increased. Uh, it's it's getting harder for it to even live on subsistence in, in that particular area. That's an example of how climate change affects those who are not seen by us. So that kind of stuff, and also engaging people like me and young people on the international level. Like, there's no there's no end to what we could do as, as individuals and as young people. Um, and I see more, more of my peers 
getting involved on an international level, whether that's through human rights, whether that's through climate change, and that for me is, is very refreshing. So what are the next areas for you to explore and to hopefully develop um, some kind of audience response on? Are they, are they geographic? Are they global? I think it's more the idea of like direct action. Um, you know, seven years ago when I first started into the fashion and media space, it was bu about building awareness, but I'm, I'm less about doing the whole like, let's do an event on awareness. It's, I I'm a firm believer that if we get people started, they'll get aware as they go. Um, and I, I don't like these flimsy events or, or conferences that might have people talking at you. I like, I like people that engage you, that, that challenge you, and that um, give you the skill set to, to be leaders in your own right. Because I think what largely the environmental movement has created is, created is a lot of follow followers. And what we actually need are leaders. And I really firmly believe that the, um, the actions that you create will build leadership out of, out of what you do. And, um, and I think that's really important for me. So if I could free up more of my time, um, create a you know, better foundation for myself, that could free up more of my time to uh, do a more, more activism, to focus more on issues like green jobs, to help um, aid my friends who are doing more direct action, indirect action, then, then that's where I want to be. So as you think about your career, you've done an awful lot in a very short period of time, but if you're projecting 10, 15, 20 years into the future, where do you see yourself? <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> Definitely not retired, because I don't think when you make this your life's work, I don't, you, you don't retire from it. Um, you know, this is, this is what makes me feel alive. This is what makes me feel passionate. And being around people who have the same type of energy and are, um, you know, also duly passionate, or people that you you make passionate because of your energy and enthusiasm, um, that that'll always be a part of what I do. So the way I guess I explain it is, my goal has always been to increase awareness in people and audiences, like, and and to build as much awareness and as much as engagement as possible. And as long as you have that goal in sight. It doesn't really matter what you do in the in interim. You could have a straight shot to that. You could be, you know, traveling over here as long as you're moving in a forward direction. So I would have never pictured myself here when I was like 18, and and I sure as heck probably won't be able to even guess what I'm doing when I'm 25, 26, 27, 28, 30, you know, or even 40 or 50 for that matter. But I know that I am, um, you know, on the path of where I really want to be because I have that 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 goal in mind um, and and that's what that's my guiding light like that's what that's what's going to keep it real for me for the rest of my life what's your next international trip where are you planning to go do you have an issue you're exploring or is this yeah I'm I'm gonna in a, about a week and a half I'll be in Mozambique uh, working on some of the projects that I work on there in the Safala province which is in the south central part of Mozambique and it's on the, the east coast of Africa, and it's, it's quite a fascinating area. It's very beautiful, and uh, it's a pretty large country. It's actually the entire, uh, it's the same length as the entire coast of the United States, and I've traversed about 60% of it, but uh, like I said, I'm working with a, w with a gentleman out there who works on 23 different sustainable forestry initiatives, so I'm really excited to be there, and we've just got a ship, shipload of his project, uh, products in that we're going to bring to the U.S., so it'll be really great to exp help expand his market and um, his work within that space because it really is a buttoned up operation that is truly socially and environmentally responsible. Fascinating. Now, do some of these trips tie in with your work for Planet Green or uh, not necessarily? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. Um, they always know where I'm, where I'm going. So this time around when uh, I do the, the trip to, to Mozambique, I'd love for them to actually do an episode on it, but like, it depends on when the production schedule is and, and what it's about. So what we've agreed to do is actually work with Discovery Networks, not just with Planet Green, which is one of their uh, channels, but with Discovery Network, they have, a, they have, a, they have a, um, an online site called Discovery Pro um, Project Earth, Project Earth Live, and they will map 
the, it's, a, it's done in collaboration with NOAA and NASA, and they will use like Google Maps and Maps to hone in on where your workplace is, and they'll, they'll do blog posts, so if I have photos or video or they might radio me in, and, and somebody could click on an issue or an issue area where some of the discovery hosts or, or people have tra scientists have traveled to, and they'll hone in on, your, on the map where it is in Mozambique, kind of zoom in on, on your project base, and then kind of do a, a little interview with you. So that's kind of cool for all the, the tech nerds out there that kind of that love maps and that love seeing issues. Like I went on there the other day and clicked on the North Pole to see you know w what's melting and where and what the scientists are saying. And it, it's kind of neat because it's in, it's in real time. Uh, so those are some of the cross-promotional projects that, that we're going to be doing. But yeah, all in all, like my when I first started my work, fashion was over here and my environmental stuff was over here. And it was, of course, my goal and for my sanity, too, to not be doing a, a split with, my, <laughs> with one leg over here and one leg over here, but to actually be able to combine them and to showcase that you could wear your values on your sleeve and, and, and live your life like this as opposed to something over here and something over here. It's like the whole fashion thing where it's like you could have your sustainability and you could have your style like right together. So that has been increasingly much, much more so in my work where everything has become t tied in with one another. So I think that will eventually happen with Discovery too. Tell us if, if you could leave one piece of advice for our audience today, especially the young people that you're working so hard to, uh, to get the word out to, what, what would that be? What would you say to them? The number one philosophy that I have is the world doesn't say no unless you let it. And I'm a firm believer in <laughs> just keep on pushing and there is absolutely no rejection. And if you feel like a one door closes, then take the back door and if back door closes, climb through the window. And, and yeah, so that would be the one thing that I would impart on people is be fearless and uh, to let you know that the world does not say no unless you let it. And you're optimistic based on your experience that your generation is stepping up to this challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, there's there's so much more momentum out there, and, and I know that um, a lot of our generation, like, you know, people people would say that it, it, it isn't so, and, and that might be true for some of us as individuals, but I see I see so so much potential in, in all of us that it's hard for me not, you know, not to be optimistic. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it, this is what gives me so much energy, and and uh, I wouldn't feel feel whole if I if I didn't have that, and and I know that um, my friends and my peers would feel the same way. Good. Well, on that note, I think we'll end, and I want to thank you, Summer Rain Oaks, for joining us today. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us as well for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.